uh, via Google Hangout is uh, Jennifer Jilks. She's in uh, Perth, Ontario today. And hi, Jennifer. Thanks so much for joining us. You're welcome, Mary. I really appreciate you taking the time because uh, we're wrapping up our Why Poverty series here at TVO that TVO is participating in. And uh, as part of that series, we had put out a call on social media asking you know, our viewers and our followers, what does poverty look like in your community? And you replied to that call and you sent in a photo, which we're just going to bring up now, uh, which moved, moved me and also moved my colleagues. Uh, it was one of um, the responses that really stood out and had a real impact on us here. And I just want you to explain what this photo is and what we're looking at. Well, we were living in Muskoka and we were delivering Meals on Wheels. We ended up becoming friends with a neighbor and this um, neighbor had such severe issues. He had lots of support in the home, but within that situation, uh, he had addictions and he had health issues. He was over medicating and having in, um, he, he would have deliveries of beer and so we went one day to visit. We were walking his dog because he couldn't possibly walk his dog anymore. And you can see the mess. Um, the, the caregivers that were hired by the government were not reporting to the um, powers that be the situations they were finding. And if you look at it, you can see that, you know, he was a smoker and he was a drinker. Um, he, would, he met us at the door one day and you can see that he was having issues with his um, digestive system and they weren't washing his sheets because there wasn't another caregiver to come in and do it. Um, he, the place was absolutely filthy. His, his uh, refrigerator, which is a big sign of poverty, addictions and healthcare issues, um, is, it had all of the meals on wheels from the past week and he hadn't eaten them so he wasn't even eating. And what really concerns me about this kind of a situation is that the, the Privacy Act, um, FIPPA, F-I-P-P-A, the Freedom of Information, it, it is precluded by the PHIPA, which is the uh, Personal Health Information Protection Act. And healthcare workers can come in and say he's a danger to himself, this is self-abuse. His family didn't know what to do, neighbors were coming in and enabling and we were trying to speak truth to power and that doesn't happen with people in poverty that the healthcare profession they are so afraid of interfering they're so afraid of of FIPA rather than coming in and realizing he was a danger to himself he was addicted he met us at the door one day and all he was wearing was a sweatshirt and no pants and he had his dog his German Shepherd in the house that wasn't being cared for neighbors were buying dog food it, it was just like one layer of complication after another and everybody afraid to step in and say this man needs help. Mm -hmm. The uh, physiotherapist came in and we wanted to call 911 and get him off to hospital because he was in such a, a bad situation. And they said, oh no, no we can't because of the privacy laws and he's saying that you know he can't go anywhere. So it, it, was, it was frightening to see this. I mean, he was the nicest man when he was sober um, and he alienated his family with many people with addictions have the same kind of a situation. Um, you know, he had a cat, he had a pet mole, and yet he needed so much help. Mm -hmm. it, it was just a sorry situation. And I should mention, Jennifer, that uh, you're a hospice volunteer, a retired teacher, and a blogger, and you've had a lot of experience uh, dealing with a variety of clients, um, whether they have, you know, addiction issues, um, mental health issues, but what interested me about this is that you responded not not by saying this is you know a, a case that I've dealt with. You're saying this is what poverty looks like to me. Tell me a bit about what it's like working with the clients you do uh, who are below the poverty line. What added stresses um, and circumstances are uh, they have to deal with? <clears throat> I, I have a wide range of clients and um, we don't just help people in poverty but it does give you a great deal of perspective because I can see the barriers to getting proper care, proper health care and proper supports in place if you are living in poverty or if you're not. Um, there are attitudes and behaviors of 
the healthcare professionals, which vary from individual to individual, and I've had people on disability who are treated with such tender loving care by their doctor, for example, um, but there are other um, clients that I've had where um, it's hard to go in because there's a smell in the in the home. Um, they're not able to care for themselves, much less their pets. So it, the barriers there are are the physicians that don't make house calls, and the nurses. There's we're I don't know 25 percent short of nurses in in this province. So if you can pay um, the for-profit Bayshore Bayshore Home Health to come in and give you extra support, you can. And if not, you're coping at home with a loved one. You. Um, will have transportation issues, especially in, in any rural place because you can't hop on, on the TTC and go in and get, get some support. And if um, out here, if you're, you're working, there are many people whose spouses are ill and they're the breadwinner and they're on hourly pay. They have to go in and if they don't go into work, they aren't paid. And um, the families, it's so different in that situation. Mm -hmm. And some of us have been asked to go in and help um, because they keep the elementary kids home from school, for example, to look after the spouse because the other spouse has to go into work. They have no choice. And while we have volunteers, there aren't enough of us. And they, uh, the funding is so short for volunteers. I don't even get mileage anymore. And I put 100 kilometers on my car in the month of September helping someone on disability who needed someone to accompany them with her wheelchair on the wheel trans to go into the city of hospital, uh, city of Ottawa. Um, she was going into the pain clinic and the heart clinic, and the, all those supports are in place. The system's not broken, but for her daughter to take time off work, it was impossible. And so that kind of situation is where we're we're doing the best we can, but but we are short in in many ways. Um, you write quite a bit about. Um, end of life care and I know that you have authored a book about your own experience uh, with a parent dealing with end of life care but but I, I would suspect that for someone below the poverty line who doesn't have the resources um, end of life care I, I would assume would be even more challenging than it already is and I'm wondering what you see or what you would recommend are the steps that we need to take um, to provide these people with resources as you mentioned um, volunteers are short. So what do you see as, as the next steps to, you know, alleviate that? Um, three things. First of all, um, I, I really believe we need patient advocates. And, and that's what I consider myself to be. Whenever I go into a client's home, I give them a copy of my book because it shows my journey from the beginning to the end. Mom died at home and dad died in long-term care, so I have that, that spectrum. Um, that's the first thing I do and then I try and give them information and they just they simply don't have the information they don't know where to go for the information simple things like um, I had a, a World War II veteran uh, living in a retirement home and he, he didn't have much money and the retirement home was promising the family they could manage but the man was starving to death because they didn't have the the personnel to be able to feed him at lunchtime. They had care coming in morning and night, but not at lunchtime in this for-profit retirement home. So simply buying something like Insure or, Bur or Boost or any of the other um, supplements because he had no teeth. Uh, again, you know, dental care has been an issue, especially with the people of that generation. Um, a lot of the families around here haven't had dental care. Um, so, so it's dietary that, that sort of thing. So the socioeconomics of not being able to, to get these um, supports, whether it's um, small supports or um, supplements, or um, the, the government does provide money for all sorts of physical supports. But for example, they're, they're touting this $1,500 tax credit. And yet, if, if you want to put in a wheelchair ramp, it's extraordinarily expensive. If you want to put in um, one of those tubs, they're $5,000. So those are some of the barriers. Um, I think from physicians who are not well-trained in geriatrics, we're so short geriatricians. We, we 
have so few specialists. It's a very complicated um, uh, specialty because they are complex care. The, in, pediatrics, geriatrics, both are very, very complex, and yet we don't have very many people that understand geriatrics and end-of-life care. I also think we need to do uh, personal support um, worker PSW regulation. There are people in there caring for, for our end-of-life clients, um, the residents of long-term care, for example, and they're all being treated the same because the PSWs have, uh, what is it, a 14-module certificate. They don't understand about end-of-life care. They, they don't want to take the time. We don't have enough of them to get the resident from the bed into the wheelchair and yet they have you know five minutes per resident to pop in get them ready for the day or to get them into bed at night so it's it's upgrading the healthcare professionals whether it's the doctors the nurses we have nurse practitioners attached to long-term care but of of the long-term care in the province 500 of the 600 are for profit and they are making decisions some of them at head offices and some of them are treating the poorest of the poor with very little dignity and, and that really concerns me. Um, the, the attitudes towards people, they, they simply don't understand that when you're in life, end of life care you need to be respected and your, your decisions need to be understood. Mm -hmm. well, well, I hope that this is the first of many conversations we'll have online here at the agenda and on the broadcast about uh, end of life care and people below the poverty line. And thank you, Jennifer, for joining us today and, and giving us a start in that. Well, thank you for listening. We, we have to fight for those living in poverty. Thanks so much.